I'm Dr. T and welcome to my whiteboard. Today I'd like to talk a bit about finding those delta H's. Uh, obviously for certain reactions, etc., you can look up the delta H's uh, for that particular reaction or phase change or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but in other cases, eh, not so easy. So uh, there's a couple of ways of acquiring a delta H of a reaction uh, when you don't necessarily know it. The first is what we call Hess's Law. And in this case, I'm going to take a reaction that I don't know the delta H for. And I'm going to find that by finding other reactions, which I do know the delta H for, and then adding them up together. And you're like, wait, what? Well, chemical reactions can be added. So if I take these three reactions, they have all of the players involved in my top reaction, and I happen to know their heat of, uh, or their delta H. Now, how do I add them? Well, for starters, uh, let's start kind of in reverse order. This bottom one, uh, the CS2 liquid, and phases are important here. So what state these are in will change the heats of reactions, so you want to make sure you line up states. That does make a big difference. Okay, uh, so this one, what I'm looking at is, hey, I'm taking uh, this CS2, that's my product in this reaction, but it's actually my reactant to start with. So what I'm going to do is like, okay, I'm going to start with this guy, but I'm going to flip it. And I'm going to make my reactants my products, and my products my reactants. Now, when I flip a reaction like that, I'm going to change the sign on my delta H. See how this delta H is positive? Now this one is negative. All I've done is flipped it. Okay, now let's look at this next one. I'm forming SO2. Okay, that's what I want to form. I am forming SO2, but you'll notice on this first reaction, I'm only forming one SO2, and I want to form two. So I'm going to multiply my reaction by two. So I'm going to have two sulfurs and two oxygens yielding two SO2s. And likewise, I'm going to multiply my heat of reaction by two. So I'm going to take this guy, and I'm going to multiply it by 2. Yeah. This one up here, actually this makes a lot of sense, and this is pretty much useful. Uh, I'm going to have carbon dioxide, that's one of my products, that's good, so I can just bring that down. And hey, this is actually going to be pretty nice. This one is going to consume the carbon uh, that was generated in this one. So I'm going to add them all up. Basically, all I'm doing is just bringing everybody in the reactants down. They're part of the reactants now. Everybody in the products, bringing those down. They're part of the products now. Now, you'll notice I have two oxygens here, one oxygen there. So when I bring them both down, it's going to become three oxygens. So I bring this guy down, nothing much. I'm going to bring down my oxygens. That's nice. I'm going to bring down my sulfur. And it's just going to sit there because things are going to happen, as you can see on the board. And I'm going to bring down my copper, or sorry, carbon, not copper. Wrong reaction. Now, uh, I do the same thing for the products. And what I realize is that, hey, you know what? Carbon is both a product and a reactant. Likewise, sulfur is both product and reactant, and it's in the same quantities. So it's two sulfurs and two sulfurs. So they cancel themselves out. And I go ahead and rewrite this equation, the sum of these three, with all of the parts that are duplicated, canceled out. Now, obviously, if I was to have, say, two sulfurs over here and three over there, then only two of the three would cancel. But I have two and two, so they all cancel. And now, this gives me a new reaction. That should look a wee bit familiar. That is that. Yay! Basically, I'm taking the reactions, I'm rearranging them, uh, so that I can create the reaction I don't know what the delta H is. Now, what am I going to do with the delta H's? Well, on this one I had flipped it, this one I had multiplied by 2, and this one I didn't do anything because this reaction is the same as that top one. Well, I'm going to keep on doing the exact same thing. I'm going to add them up. So now, I sum all of these guys, and Bada boom, bada bang, I got myself my delta H. This delta H is the sum of the delta H's going into it. Now, this reaction probably doesn't actually involve going into these steps. 
you probably don't actually take the CS2, break it into elemental sulfur and elemental carbon. Um, but delta H's are actually what we call a state function. It matters where you're at, not how you get there. It is conceivable to drive from Atlanta to Chattanooga by just driving from Atlanta to Chattanooga. Or you can go from Atlanta to Birmingham to St. Louis to Memphis, then to Chattanooga. Kind of a silly way to go there, but you're still where you're at, and it doesn't really matter which way you took once you get there. Now, there's a couple of shortcuts that are a little bit alluded to. See how all of these reactions, we are starting with the elemental component. We're starting with elemental carbon. And in fact, that would be carbon sulfur comma graphite, or GR, if I wanted to be a little bit more fancy. Uh, because the elemental form of carbon is graphite. Not diamond. That would be kind of cool, but it's not. Uh, this is what we call allotropes, where you've got more than one form of a particular element. And usually the most common or kind of standard allotrope is the one we think of as the elemental form, even though they really are all uh, the elemental form of them. You will have a delta H going between allotropes. Now, uh, these are going from their elemental form, their standard base elemental form, whether it be O2 as a gas, carbon as a solid graphite, or, or whatnot. And they're forming into compounds. When the reaction is like this, then the delta H of the reaction is known by a different name. It's known as a heat of formation, or delta H sub F. And these can be looked up in a table. So if you look up heat of formation for SO2 gas, that's this guy, that's this reaction. You usually won't see the whole reaction, instead you'll just see the delta H uh, for the heat of formation of uh, sulfur dioxide. Okay. So now I can look these up in the table. That's great. But I can save you even more time. Because if you are working with heats of formation, and you do not have to have these being heats of formation, you can have any old reaction so long as they're able to sum together to get the reaction you want. These do not have to be heats of formation. Just to be clear, they can be other reactions. And if that's the case, the shortcut's not going to work. But if they are heats of formation, which they typically are because those are things you can look up in a table pretty easily, then your delta H of your reaction, so the answer I'm looking for, is going to be the sum of all of the heats of formation of your products. Now, if there is, say, two products of the same type being produced, I'm going to multiply it by two. So, in my reaction, I'm forming two SO2s, so I'm going to multiply my heat of formation for my sulfur dioxide by two. That's what the N says. The N is the coefficient. So, all of the heats of formation multiplied by their coefficient, subtracting the sum of all of the heats of formation multiplied by their coefficient of the reactants. So this is going to be products minus reactants. Do that and you will get delta H of reaction. Pretty straightforward and to be honest a lot easier and cleaner than doing it this way. But this way you don't have to have delta H reactions for those heats of formation. You can have a delta H reaction of any type of reaction you want. Last other caveat, when you are looking up these delta H of formations, so these heats of formations, when you're looking them up, what you will find is that you can't find, quite often, elements. If I want to look up the heat of formation of oxygen, it probably won't be in my table. There's a fairly straightforward reason for this. It's zero. Whenever you have those basic elemental forms, the heat of formation is going from that form to a different form. The distance you need to drive to go from Chattanooga to Chattanooga is zero. You're already in Chattanooga. The distance I need to go from oxygen to oxygen is zero. It's already oxygen. So heats of formation for elements in their elemental form, in their kind of standard allotrope, is zero. You'll also notice one other thing when looking at these formation. They're almost always negative, or maybe slightly positive. Heats of formation, uh, when they're negative, suggest that the compound will generate or give off energy when it's formed, and 
typically that means it's likely to be formed. If the compound gives off energy when it degrades, and there's a good chance it's just going to go ahead and degrade. Okay, quick aside, when it comes to balancing equations for use with Hess's law, with enthalpies of formation, or with just enthalpies of some weird reaction, uh, whatever you happen to be doing, uh, enthalpies of combustion are notorious for this. It's usually balanced so that the equation only has one of the molecule of interest. So here's the heat of formation for carbon monoxide. Notice how there's a half in front of my oxygen. So if I was to do this with the normal balancing, I'd have a two here, nothing there, and then a two there. But typically with enthalpies of formation in particular, but other enthalpies of various other reactions, these will be balanced so that the chemical of interest, in this case the CO, has a coefficient of one. And this makes life easier elsewhere. It allows you to do the whole shortcut on Hess's law. But just be forewarned. You do get fractional uh, coefficients at times. Okay, so there's another way of doing uh, delta H. In this case, I'm going to use what's known as a bond dissociation enthalpy, or BDE. Uh, sometimes you call it bond enthalpy or bond energy, and sometimes it gets a delta H involved in the naming, but they're basically meaning the same thing. The idea here is that if you have a bond, it's going to take energy to break that bond. You've got two atoms, they're hanging out together, you're going to have to split those atoms apart. And the goal here is we're going to split those atoms apart, and we're going to assume they split each taking one of the two electrons. Um, this may or may not actually be happening in your reaction, and bond association enthalpies are generally going to be averages, so this more so than the heats of formation are going to have a little bit more of a caveat on the answer, but still gives you a pretty straightforward answer, and it's great when you don't have heats of formation because you've got some crazy molecule uh, that you just don't have data for, but you can get data for those bonds. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to take a reaction. In this case, I'm going to have methanol and hydrobromic acid. Uh, they're going to react. They're going to go through some transition states. This would probably not actually take place. This is that assumption that each bond that's going to break is going to break apart each atom taking one of the two electrons. The brackets mean that they're in a transition state. In reality, this is a slightly different reaction. The bonds don't break cleanly. It's more of a kind of a, a sharing and transitioning into the other style uh, reaction. But that's for organic chemistry, which is a bit down the line. Anyways, eventually I'm going to get um, bromomethane and water in this reaction. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I need to look up bond association enthalpies for all the bonds that are either broken or formed. And, yep, there they are. And then I'm going to do a simple summation, very similar to the heats of formation, uh, but a little bit different. By the way, bond association enthalpies, notice how these are all positive? That's the energy it's going to take to break them. You always take energy to break a bond, even though some folks are going to say, hey, you get energy by uh, breaking bonds. You don't. It's like saying you make money by buying stock. No, it costs money to buy stock. You make it when you sell it. So if you assume that you're going to be able to reform a bond and in that process you're going to get more energy back than it took to break it, then yes, you do get energy out. But that is an assumption that as chemists we don't generally make. Well, all I'm going to do is take the bond association enthalpies. Once again, times by the number of bonds. I only have one of each bond, so it's all times by one. So it's fairly straightforward here. But if I was to say break two or three of that particular type of bond, and keep in mind here, double bonds and triple bonds would only count as one of their respective type. So if it was a carbon-oxygen double bond, this would be a different number. It would be a higher number. You'd have to look that one up separately. So I take all the ones I'm breaking, I add them up, and I add up all the ones I'm going to form, and then broken minus form gives me my final answer, which in this case is 17 kilojoules per mole. So actually not that much. I mean, it's not trivial, but it's not that much for this particular reaction. Uh, each reaction, of course, will be different. Uh, with that said, have a wonderful day. Enjoy calculating uh, delta H's, and see you next time.